This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by our wonderful friends at World Anvil. If you haven't heard of World Anvil, they're a web-based world-building platform and campaign manager with all types of creators in mind. For Dungeon Masters, this is one of the best digital tool sets out there. All of the open content and stat blocks from the 5e basic rules are built right into the platform. If you're like me and always losing track of your notes, you can search through your creations with the powerful Artemis Spotlight so you can quickly find that obscure note you made during the game three months ago. One of my favorite parts about World Anvil is that they have interactive maps that you can create and share with your players with information for the players and secret information that's just for you as a DM. The best part is that an account at World Anvil is free and offers all the basic features allowing you to get a good taste of what the platform offers. There's some fa fantastic advanced features available at the master and grandmaster level. So if you're interested in checking those out, you can use the discount code Dungeon Dudes to save up to 20% off the first part of your membership. You can find all of this by following the links below or at worldanvil.com. And now, onto this week's episode. High-level combat encounters in Dungeons and Dragons are characterized by climatic battles against legendary creatures such as dragons, beholders, and mind flayer overlords or demon lords themselves. But not every combat encounter and not every dungeon can be filled with room after room of such legendary and terrible creatures. Even legendary creatures need their underlings, and as a dungeon master, you may want to look at these five creatures to throw into your games to whittle down that party before they reach that final encounter. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we discuss everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for dungeon masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking an in-depth look at five deadly high-level monsters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. As with most of our monster videos, we were looking for monsters that had a deadly edge or a unique ability that can take out a party. We're not looking for just damage-dealing brutes. There are a lot of those, and they're always fun to throw against your party. But if you're looking for something with a little bit more flavor and a little bit more intrigue, these five monsters are going to pack a certain and specific punch that your party might not see coming. We believe that high-level play is the time to take the kid gloves off, stop pulling those punches, and really deliver a couple knockouts and gotchas to your players. They've had enough time now to get used to how their characters work, and it's time for them to be truly tested by some deadly threats. There's lots to discuss, so let's get looking at the monsters. As usual, the order that we've chosen to present these monsters in is not our favorites or anything of that nature. It is by challenge rating, going from the lowest challenge rating monster we picked up to the highest. Furthermore, we also examine these monsters with the consideration that they would be facing a party of approximately the same level as their challenge rating. The first monster we're going to look at today is the Devourer. He is a large fiend found on the pages of Volo's Guide to Monsters on page 138. The Devourer is a large fiendish creature which resembles an undead ogre. Its protruding ribcage imprisons a tortured soul that the creature drains its life energy to fuel its malign powers. Clocking in a challenge rating 13, this fiend has massive claws that it can use against you that not only do slashing damage, but also 6d6 necrotic damage on a hit. In addition to making two claw attacks with its multi-attack, the Devourer can unleash a soul-rending vortex. Soul Rend creates a vortex of necrotic energy in a 20-foot radius centered around the Devourer. Humanoid creatures within this vortex must make a constitution saving throw or they will take an average of 44 points of damage. While this can be a good chunk of damage on its own, the damage is increased by 10 points for each creature at zero hit points within the area. So if the Devourer is surrounded by a group of the dead and the dying, it empowers this attack, making it even deadlier against the survivors. 
The scariest ability that the Devourer has, however, is Imprison Soul. This allows it to choose a target that is at zero hit points within 30 feet of it, teleport it into its soul rib cage, where it will then use its energy to fuel its abilities. Not only that, but the creature trapped in the rib cage now has disadvantage on death saving throws. If the unfortunate humanoid creature imprisoned in this way dies while imprisoned, the devourer gains 25 hit points, immediately recharges soul rend, and can take an extra action on its next turn. Furthermore, during its next turn, the devourer can regurgitate the body of the slain creature, causing it to rise as an undead creature, with power commiserate with how many hit dice the creature had before dying. Weaker creatures only become zombies, but more powerful ones will become ghouls and whites on the other side, so immediately slain and transformed into an undead creature. I could see the Devourer being a general in Orcus' army, or one of his lieutenants or scouts who goes out and finds the party on behalf of Orcus, or even dealing with a large group of soldiers, which is even scarier if it's knocking down NPCs, devouring them, getting its soul rend ability back. It has a lot of ways that it can clean through a large group of people and creating an army of undead in its wake. I think of the Devourer in relation to the Mereji, who we looked at in our prior episode on deadly mid-level monsters, and think that Orcus has a real tendency to impersonate and capture humanoid creatures in the midst of battle and transform them into undead thralls. I think of how the Devourer could be used to assassinate a target and then transform them, and now that they're undead, Orcus can command them and seize on all their knowledge as well. I think that the really key thing to notice about the various abilities of the Devourer, though, is that its soul rend only works on humanoid creatures. It's, if it's fighting alongside other undead or other fiends, they're unaffected by the damage of that attack. And so when the Devourer has allies, particularly allies that can deal a lot of damage, as soon as a player character goes down, the Devourer will target them and imprison them and really make the effort to finish them off as quickly as possible. So what makes the Devourer so deadly is using it in tandem with other creatures where it is going to literally prey on the fallen. Its whole objective is to deliver the coup de gras to a dying player character. One thing that isn't really clear in the rules here is what happens if you heal the creature that is trapped in his ribcage? That's a really good question, because it doesn't prevent that creature from being healed. They just have disadvantage on death saving throws. But it isn't clear how a creature that is trapped in there escapes. So perhaps you might have to make an additional ruling here and decide, okay, if you're healed while you're still within it, are you still trapped in there and therefore restrained? Or do you immediately escape if you are healed and now conscious once you get out? I can't think of much scarier things than coming to inside the rib cage of a giant demonic zombie ogre, but could happen. Next up is an iconic creature in the Dungeons and Dragons canon. Found on page 340 of the basic rules, this is the titanic purple worm. The purple worm is our gargantuan monstrosity clocking in at challenge rating 15. This giant purple beast burrows through the ground, appearing only to devour or sting its subjects, or both. These creatures are known for tunneling deep underneath the Underdark and may be responsible for many of the Underdark passages. Travelers underground, beware. If you're heading through a cavernous passage that is irregularly uniform in its shape, very curved with regular ridges all throughout, you may actually find yourself in the tunnels of a purple worm. And you need to get out of there as soon as possible before you become lunch. The purple worm has an armor class of 18 and almost 250 hit points, making it a pretty challenging creature to fight. Not only that, but with its blind sense and tremor sense, as well as a burrowing speed of 30 feet and the tunneler ability, this creature can go without being seen until it devours you. The purple worm has two very impressive attacks, its bite and its tail stinger. Its tail stinger does a good amount of piercing damage, but also 
12d6 points of poison damage on a failed constitution saving throw if you are hit by it. But its bite attack is perhaps far more fearsome. With plus 14 bonus to hit, the bite attack deals a good amount of damage, but immediately causes the target to have to make a dexterity saving throw of DC 19 or be swallowed by the purple worm. They are left blinded and restrained in the gullet of the worm and start taking acid damage every time they start their turn there. Now it is possible to cut your way out of a purple worm if you have found yourself devoured by it. You need to do 30 points of damage in a single turn to the inside of the worm and the worm makes a constitution saving throw to see if it's going to regurgitate you back up. Now, the purple worm on its own is often seen as a big brute that just gets beaten up. The typical purple worm encounter works something like this. The party is heading through the desert or a cavernous environment or a rocky plain or the underdark and are suddenly ambushed from underground by a purple worm who can track the party using its tremor sense and burrowing speed. Often the only clue that a purple worm is coming is a soft rumbling underfoot before it bursts through the ground and immediately attacks one of the player characters during the surprise round. This hapless character is almost usually swallowed immediately. The problem is many dungeon masters get greedy with their purple worms and they try to continue to devour each member of the party one after another. But this is not the way a purple worm usually hunts. And as a matter of fact, they make a much more interesting monster when they're not just being used as a brute, but instead a clever tactical hunter. The purple worm at challenge rating 15 can be annihilated actually quite quickly by many high level parties. It's not hard for a group of 15th level characters to deal enough damage to take it down or use magic such as teleportation or some other techniques to save someone that's been devoured by the purple worm. This is why it's important to remember that the purple worm is still a predatory creature with hunter instincts. And once it's burrowed up from the ground and got one morsel in its gullet, it doesn't have much reason to stay above ground anymore and will immediately burrow back under the earth to digest its meal. A particularly hungry purple worm might go back for seconds, but a purple worm very much prefers to be underground and shouldn't stay above ground too often. This makes it a much scarier creature. When it uses its two attacks in tandem with each other, appears, stings a party member, devours it, and then disappears back under the ground with its burrowing speed, leaving the rest of the party wondering where the heck their party member just went or wondering where it's gonna pop up next. So again, because the purple worm has a burrowing speed of 30 feet, it can lurk just underneath the surface of its prey and it can detect them thanks to its tremor sense. It then only has to use a little bit of its movement to burst up from underneath the ground, grab somebody, devour them, and pull them back underneath the earth. So in a single surprise round, the purple worm can already be making headway back deep underneath the earth with its latest meal, putting the party in a very difficult position to save their party member as the earth collapses behind the burrowing purple worm. It may leave a tunnel behind it. It really depends. The rules aren't entirely clear on whether or not the purple worm can choose or choose not to leave that tunnel in its wake. Because so many DMs like to run the purple worm as a brute damage dealer, they often run them in groups. But a single purple worm on its own using tactical attack strategies actually is just a deadly threat on its own without having to group them up. A purple worm makes an excellent guardian for a flying villain in a remote lair. So a villain that knows that the purple worm is there and just uses it for its natural proclivities as a predator can simply find its own ways of bypassing it, making this a very interesting relationship. I once had a lich that had a sphinx in the middle of the desert that they had warded their lair so the purple worms couldn't burrow through it, but then they just chose that spot in the desert because they knew that was the hunting grounds for a group of purple worms, and none would go close to the lich's lair for fear of all the purple worms that lived there. Purple worms have always been an iconic monster in lore and history. And if you want some inspiration, you can always check out the works of Dune or the movie Tremors. The Machiavellian plots of the Dark Elves of the Underdark know no bounds. 
Trafficking with demons, murder, kidnapping, blackmail. These are their tricks and trade. And over the, the years, the Dark Elves have created and bred many of their own monsters to serve the ends of the dark politics of the many houses of their subterranean cities. One of these many creatures is the Retriever, a terrifying fiendish construct of metal crafted in the shape of a spider. The Retriever clocks in a challenge rating 14 and can be found in the pages of Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, page 222. This creature has a long list of damage and condition immunities and can't be hurt by non-magical weapons unless they're made of adamantium. This creature has over 200 hit points, blind sight, and great perception and stealth. All of these senses and defenses are there to equip the Retriever for its very specific purpose. For the Retriever is a faultless tracker. It is given a quarry by its master and can unerringly detect the direction of that quarry as long as the two are on the same plane of existence. This quarry can be a specific creature or object the master is acquainted with, or it can be more generic. And the Retriever always knows the direction and approximate distance this target is, in addition to also knowing the location of its master. The Retriever is also an innate spellcaster. It can cast the web spell three times per day at a saving throw DC of only 13, but it can also cast the plane shift spell three times per day as well. And when the Retriever casts plane shift, it has one interesting permutation. Normally, the Retriever can only plane shift itself. However, the Retriever can also plane shift itself with up to one incapacitated creature. And a creature that is incapacitated is considered willing for the purposes of the plane shift spell, which means that it can bring along a normally unwilling target as long as that target has been incapacitated in some way, shape, or form. The Retriever also has some incredible attack abilities. Not only will the Retriever attack you with its forelegs, but it has two awesome magical attacks in the form of beams, a force beam and a paralyzing beam. The force beam is quite simple. It just does a good chunk of force damage, but the one to be really worried about is the paralyzing beam. When you are struck with the paralyzing beam, you have to make a constitution saving throw of 18 or else you are paralyzed for one minute. Keep in mind that this lends itself very well to the retriever's ability to then plane shift out of there with the incapacitated target. In addition, if the paralyzed target is medium or smaller, retrievers can walk up to them, pick them up, automatically with their movement alone and their movement isn't slowed down including both their walk and climb speeds so a retriever can paralyze a target scuttle up to them and begin scuttling away with them on their back without any penalties to their speed at that point you basically only have one round to recover before the retriever is going to plane shift away with your friend we now come to a horrific monstrosity from the legions of undead, towering above all of the other minions before them, the Nightwalker. These terrifying entities are the apex of the undead curse, second only to such intelligent undead creatures such as vampires, mummy lords, and liches themselves. For despite all their power, the relatively unintelligent Nightwalker is a formidable undead engine of annihilation. Coming in at challenge rating 20, the Nightwalker has almost 300 hit points and a whole slew of various resistances and immunities. The Nightwalker has a speed of 40 feet and a flying speed of 40 feet as well. And it is a huge undead creature, making it quite unique as this is an undead creature that is transformed and born out of the Plains of Shadow or the Shadowfell and not necessarily a creature that has been reanimated. It is truly a lost and damned soul that has found the power of oblivion and been turned into a force of simple death. To start, the Nightwalker emits an annihilating aura up to 30 feet away from it that requires a constitution save of 21 in order to avoid its attacks. Anytime you fail the saving throw, you take 4d6 necrotic damage and the Nightwalker has advantage on all attacks against you. However, the simple and terrifying trait of the Nightwalker 
is its life eater power. For if the Nightwalker's damage reduces you to zero hit points, you die and cannot be revived by any means short of a wish spell, annihilating your essence and scattering out to the negative energy plane. The Nightwalker has some great attack abilities like Enervating Focus and Finger of Doom. Enervating Focus actually will reduce your hit point maximum, where Finger of Doom has a decent amount of damage that can paralyze its target. But really, what it comes down to with the Nightwalker is that if you are reduced to zero hit points, you're dead. This makes the Nightwalkers perhaps the favored guardians of very powerful undead creatures and villains. I could see certainly a Lich Lord using a Nightwalker as almost its guardian monster. It is the ace in the hole, the creature that it pulls out to cover its escape, to occupy its most dangerous foes while the Lich Lord finishes its ritual. Truly a terrifying threat. This is especially deadly if you imagine a Lich controlling a Nightwalker because Liches have a lot of layer abilities and other options to stop players from healing. If you combine that with a creature that can kill them dead at zero hit points, you have a pretty deadly encounter on your hands. Even just a Necromancer using Chill Touch, which Chill Touch prevents you from regaining hit points if you're hit by it. And so you're kind of putting the players on a ticking clock down to their eventual annihilation. And I think this really, this is a really unique and scary ability because I think so many players that are used to having some kind of healing, like healing word or potions or a potent healer in their group, don't worry too much about what happens when the players hit zero hit points. But then you have to face a Nightwalker and the prospect of being reduced to zero hit points, that is the end. There's no safety net all of a sudden. And I think having that safety net just suddenly whisked out from underneath you is a perfect way to challenge a high level party that is used to relying on their healing abilities. The scariest thing about the Nightwalker is that it can surprise you with how much damage it could do. If it scores a critical hit or unloads all of its attacks on a single target, it might be able to reduce them to zero hit points. Usually not a very scary thing in most combat encounters, player characters often have ways of getting back up, and D&D 5th edition is notorious for people saying, oh, it's much harder to die because of this safety net. But take that away from the players? and suddenly death is much more likely. And very permanent too, because of the stipulation that only a wish spell can bring the target back. Now, player characters that are fighting a challenge rating 20 creature like a Nightwalker may have access to the power of the wish spell, but that is still a significant cost requiring a ninth level spell slot and a spell that is only accessible to a smaller subset of player characters. If you don't have a wizard or a sorcerer in your party, you might be out of luck. The final creature we are looking at today is the highest challenge rating creature across the three core monster books in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that is not a true legendary creature. Bit of a disclaimer, it technically does have legendary resistance, but it doesn't have legendary actions, which we think is the real marker of a true legendary creature. This is the Marut, one of the inevitables, introduced in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes on page 213 and clocking in at an intimidating challenge rating 25. In a world of treacherous Yugoloths, untrustworthy demons, and conniving devils, the contracts made and signed and bound in the halls of Concordance and Sigil allow for some reliability to the dark deals made across the plains. The Maruts are their enforcers. The Marut has an incredible armor class of 22, as well as over 400 hit points. Not only that, but combined with some good resistances and immunities, this is one tough monster. Nigh unpervious and unstoppable, as befits their inevitable nature. The Marut has magic resistance as well as immunity to any spell that would alter its form. On top of that, it has legendary resistance, which makes it one of the few creatures in all of Dungeons & Dragons that has legendary resistance, but is not a legendary creature. Not to mention it has the ability to innately cast Plane Shift at will making it very similar to the Retriever in that respect. The Marut is a no-nonsense brute in combat. Its attacks hit automatically, 
and always deal 60 forts damage. Befitting their nature of lawful and inevitable creatures, their attacks simply cannot be stopped, they cannot be avoided, they always do maximum damage, and as force damage, it's very hard to get resistance to force damage in the game. So they're just gonna lay into somebody for 120 points of damage. Ain't nothing you can do about it to stop it. No armor class, nothing is gonna protect you from that unless you got some way of teleporting out of the way or evading the attacks. Disadvantage isn't gonna matter. Advantage isn't gonna matter. Just bam, bam, 120 points of damage from two punches. Not only will it punch you for 120 damage, but it also has an ability called Blazing Edict, which creates a 60 foot cube of radiant energy that does 45 damage to anybody in that space. Not only that, but they have to make a DC 20 wisdom saving throw or be stunned. Blazing Edict recharges on a five or a six. And again, there's no way of avoiding this damage. There's no saving throw to avoid the 45 radiant damage. You only get to avoid whether or not you are stunned by the Blazing Edict. Lastly, the Marut has an ability called Justify, which allows it to target two creatures within 60 feet of it who must make a DC 20 Charisma saving throw or be instantly teleported to the Halls of Concordance in Sigil. If the target is incapacitated, it automatically fails the saving throw. So if you previously failed your saving throw against the Blazing Edict and are stunned, the Marut can just scoop away with you instantaneously as well. If you do fail your saving throw and you are teleported to the Halls of Concordance, the Marut immediately teleports along with you, so it brings its quarry along back with it to its masters in the Hall of Concordance. Again, this creature falls into the same category as the Retriever, but this one to me seems much scarier with its automatic hits and its ability to dish out enough damage to take out really any player character, even at level 20. I could see them dishing out enough damage to really do a number to some of the squishier characters. This is very true. The Marut can be just an assassin, but I think that much like the Retriever, and in fact, the other, many of the other creatures that we discussed, the interesting plot device caused by whisking away a player character to the Halls of Concordance is a really interesting element, and it yields a combat encounter where the characters have some play to resist the Marut. Can they stop it before it scoops away the NPC ally with them or one of the player characters back to Sigil? It makes me wonder about who made the deal in the Halls of Concordance. What was the contract they signed and how was that breached? There's so much mystery and story and plot already in this creature, but then you also get this awesome, memorable combat encounter where the player characters kind of lose when they have to face it. For you DMs out there, if your player characters are making some questionable choices and acting as high level murder hobos, it might be a good time to call in the inevitables to incite some justice into them. You have to be careful about using these creatures as a plot device versus using them as a method of railroading or overpowering your characters. And certainly it's better to use the inevitables and the retrievers in this way than simply as a way of simply removing a player character from the party that you don't like. Um, you can use them in that way if you want to. If a player character has gone far enough and it's like you, your shenanigans deserve this kind of repercussion, sure, try it. And at least that way they get a chance to fight back. But it's a pretty deadly threat. And I think caught by surprise, a lot of players are not going to be able to respond quickly enough to get away. So this has been a look at five deadly high-level monsters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If we miss any of your favorite monsters, tell us about them in the comments below. And of course, if you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more guides and in-depth looks at the monsters of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.